that's um, a, lot, a lot more water than we're used to having around here. Um, uh, it impacted me and lots of the community. Road closures, power and internet and phone outages, property loss and damage, being displaced from you know, evacuations, whether it was voluntary or mandatory, and just general harm to physical and emotional health. Even if you didn't lose a house or a garage to a tree fall, um, you probably had some sleep sleepless nights or just like had some sort of processing you needed to do. But let's leave the human element aside for now um, and explore sort of these three main topics. What do floods do to natural landscapes and the San Lorenzo River itself? How does flooding harm the ecosystem? And how does, does flooding have any benefits to the river ecosystem? Um, we've seen um, how it really does not play well with our neighborhoods and our physical properties that we own, um, but how it might impact things outside of the, the human scope and sphere. Um, here's a pretty popular map, uh, at least in my world, of the San Lorenzo <laughs> River watershed, broken into kind of like the um, lower river where it enters out into the Monterey Bay. That's down at the very bottom of this picture um, near where it says Branson Forty Creek. You know, it's blocked up river, uh, mid, in the midway, I'd maybe call this the mid river. You see Zionty Creek, which is a really important tributary coming in. Um, Felton is also kind of at the Zionty Creek and Main Stem Junction, more or less. And then the top block of this watershed map shows kind of the tributaries that start the, the main river system or the headwaters is what you might call it. Specifically, the San Lorenzo River watershed is 29, maybe 29.2 miles long, depending on who you ask, starting in Castle Rock State Park, which is way up at the top of this image, flowing down to Main Beach and Santa Cruz by the Trestle Bridge and Boardwalk. 138 square miles in area. It's not a super big watershed, but um, it's not insignificant. Provides drinking water for 100,000 residents. Um, guessing most of all of you, if you live in Santa Cruz or anywhere around here, you're probably drinking the San Lorenzo River and bathing in it. Um, habitat for many of the county is 7,600 species, including 30 rare and protected species. Um, and I got that 7,600 species figure from iNaturalist, which is a really cool community science app and website where you can take pictures of what you see out in nature. Scientists can help you identify it, and it's usable data that people can use for all sorts of projects, whether you're in school or PhD or whatever it is. Our San Lorenzo River watershed has unique habitats. Redwoods, sand hills, maritime chaparral, oak woodlands, and coastal prairie. And all the ecotones and places where those kind of blend together and phase out and phase in. Naturally, our watershed is super steep and erosive, so keep that in mind. Um, it's mostly made up of fine sediments until you hit our granite bedrock, and it's um, historically a seabed. So imagine like the silt and stuff that might accumulate at your toes on the beach um, was, you know, is now at the top of our mountains. It's compressed and, and different chemically maybe a little bit, but that's what we've got to work with. Lots of fault lines and tectonics on top of that. You probably have all experienced an earthquake around here or two or more. Um, we get lots of rain compared to lots of other places in California, and we have incredible biodiversity. So the nature of this watershed is just incredibly diverse. Um, there's a lot going on here, and it's set up to be really alive, um, whether that's geologically or the, um, the biological life plants and animals, including this beautiful Pacific giant salamander that my partner Andrea took a beautiful photo of. We call her Mrs. Grubbs, um, and she lives here in Felton. Unnaturally, though, we have had a long history of extractive industries, whether that's logging, um, which I don't need to go on too much of a tangent for, but logging really has devastated our watershed with the clear cuts. Um, trees hold soil in place. Without trees, the soil is free to move where it pleases. Um, we've straightened a lot out a lot of the river channel. Um, we typically, rivers really meander around and hop channels and do all sorts of wild stuff, but to move logs around in the redwood logging days, they would straighten the river, put up little dams to make ponds, fill those ponds with logs, pull out that dam, and the logs and river would shoot straight down to like the trains or the track or whatever, um, wherever they were going. And so we have a straighter river that has become more channelized. We have sewers and septic systems that can potentially seep sewage into the groundwater, which ends up in the San Lorenzo River. Um, we have lots of impermeable pavement, so sidewalks and parking lots and rooftops and streets um, don't let water in. When water hits
is that it has to run off because it can't percolate or permeate. So that, rip call, that uh, product is called stormwater runoff, when runoff from a storm hits the surface and it has to go somewhere. Um, and it takes along with it the trash, the oil leaks, the treads of tire, uh, you name it. Whatever you see on the streets, when it rains, that stuff goes down the drain um, and into the river, which goes into the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Um, here are my very uh, schematic and perfect diagrams. <laughs> I was going to try to make some really beautiful ones and realize that takes so much time. And I work with fourth graders, and this works for fourth graders, and tonight it's going to work for you. Um, so imagining that the river might be flowing from left to right, um, I want to just call out a couple features of rivers. Um, this is an installation made by people. So hydrologists and watershed scientists might see a spot in a river that is really prime for some habitat. Or maybe it has something that is really unfavorable uh, to an ecosystem. Like maybe there's a, a landslide right here. We don't really want landslides happening. Or maybe you know this is a really uniform stretch and we want diversity for watersheds. And so humans might install a large wood structure or a stream cluster where they will bring boulders in and anchor them to logs and really make these The Felton features. Library will be closing in 15 minutes. Oh, All right. You can, you can announce, you can expect one more in about 15 minutes. <laughs> yes. um, no, so we're, we're going to be able to leave through the patio. <laughs> um, these, little pool, these little falls scour out pools so it's deeper, colder water with more oxygen in it. Boulders and trees really help uh, keep the stream bed in place. Fallen trees are really critical, and that's something that we are really, really, really trying to promote. Um, that fallen trees, even though they look ugly and they make the water like, has to go around it and it's kind of inconvenient for people, it's really important to have wooden streams. Um, the water will go underneath this wood in high flows and we'll scour that out, and with it, we'll scour out a bunch of sediment. That sediment might be cobble or gravel or pebbles or sand or silt. Um, and that stuff gets naturally sorted just by the flow of water. So the heavier stuff sinks down first, the lighter stuff sinks down later, and some of that sand and silt you see um, after a rainstorm, the San Lorenzo River looks like chocolate milk, mm -hmm. and that is all the suspended sediment. That's the light stuff that's not going to settle up. Um, overhanging plants are awesome. There are always eddies, so slow-moving, kind of circulating water behind large features like boulders. Tributaries come in, bringing more water and more sediment into the system. Before the river was so incised, historically the San Lorenzo River and Zianti Creek channels migrated all over the flatlands of Felton. This is a river valley that we're in, so we wouldn't, shouldn't be surprised that the river has used this valley for you know, a million years, I think is what people uh, say, how old this watershed is, around a million years. Um, in big storms, the river still tries, though. It's, um, it's, still a, it's still a wild one, even though we've kind of forced it to be more tame than it might be naturally. Kind of the same deal with the side view, a pool with bubbles. You can see some gravel sorting happening here. Um, scour behind and below. Uh, stream wood, gravel sorting, all important things to consider. And if you're laying on your belly in the creek and looking upstream, this is sort of the perspective I'm hoping you can picture. Um, riparian zone is right at the stream edge. It's got lots of plants. Yeah. Uh, those plants are loving water, like willow trees are probably the most important and most common plant to see along streams, alder trees as well. Um, and when the river would rise up a little bit into the riparian zone, um, we would call that a bankful river level. And if it goes beyond that, you're kind of experiencing a flood and water should be spilling out onto these floodplains, which naturally are plains uh, that uh, accommodate floods, hence the name floodplain. <laughs> so they're usually flat, they're usually really fertile because of all that sediment that's been distributed over time. Um, they're amazing, they're really important for river systems, and the San Lorenzo Valley has really um, disconnected the San Lorenzo River from its floodplain. Uh, with the channelizing of the river, our river channel is actually a lot lower. So if you're hiking around Henry Cowell State Park and you look out at the San Lorenzo River, you're usually looking down like a pretty steep ravine. You can't just like walk uh, from the flatlands toward the water's edge. So um, our river is really channelized. That means any tributary streams um, that would normally connect with the surface water of the river are now perched, 
which is making, making erosion problems, eating away the banks, migrating fish and other animals can't access those streams and all this habitat is lost because our river is lower. Um, and our floodplains are now like beach flats neighborhood in Santa Cruz. Anywhere that's flat that has lots of fertile soil is either a farm or like a human community and neighborhood. So it's awesome habitat for nature and it's really awesome habitat for people as well. So we don't have a lot of floodplain access. So I wanted to say that I went out and asked them if they could not play the awful marching music that they play to get everybody out of the <laughs> library when it closes, and they said there's no way to stop it. Oh. So when you, it, it's it's very, you yeah. probably have to stop the presentation. You can all have a dance <laughs> um, Here are some before and after, or I guess after and before pictures right there. Um, I took this one just the other day. This is the Water Street Bridge downtown. That's what it looked like on January 9th. Um, shout out to my buddy Treetop for that photo um, out on Stormwatch. So we're going to talk about how bad floods are for the ecosystem. Uh, they could definitely cause some issues, and they aren't good ones. In terms of water quality and quantity, <coughs> how clean is the water and how much of it is there? Um, so much rainfall can really saturate septic systems and yards containing them, like leach fields. And when those are swamped, um, there's a lot of overland flow and stormwater runoff that um, that water has to go somewhere. And if it can't sink into the ground, it's gonna run off and find its way downhill into what's going to be the creek or our San Lorenzo River. Um, and turbid and really murky water, that chocolate milk colored river from suspended sediment makes treating drinking water really difficult. Um, so they'll bring in water, they'll run it through the filters, but their filters have to be working in overtime, their people have to be working in overtime to make sure that the water can get clean enough to be distributed because there's so much sediment in it. Um, so that's kind of an issue. Uh, I was told that we have lots of high-tech equipment to make this stuff work and to clean this water, but the real best cleaner is a healthy watershed. So when we have a healthy watershed, it's cleaner drinking water and easier for us to have clean drinking water. Um, erosion and streamwood accumulation can threaten the property of streamside homes. So if you or someone you know lives near a creek, you probably have seen that their landscape might have been pretty well altered uh, over the flood, so flood season we had. We don't have a lot of water storage, so even though we often experience drought here, um, in wet years like this, we can't actually capture and keep that much water. We don't have huge natural lakes or ponds or wetlands. Uh, we have Loch Lomond Reservoir, which is awesome. We don't necessarily need to dam up more tributaries to make more reservoirs. Um, we have here in the San Lorenzo River uh, watershed, all the water that we drink is sourced from here. It's super local. It's not part of the California aqueduct. It's not part of any other water distribution project. It's not getting water from Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, like uh, that's in the Sierra Nevada Mountains, like San Francisco does. All of our water is here. It's from here. And we don't we can't really hold on to very much of it. So it all goes to sea. So that's kind of the downside of having all this water come at once. Um, it doesn't, it can't also go. And then chemical leaching from geology, I thought this was really interesting. A lot of, well, there are some instances in the geology around here where there are like heavy metals and other sorts of chemicals that aren't really good to be out and exposed to, to nature. Um, and I think of uh, Almaden Park in South San Jose was a former Quicksilver or Mercury mine. So that stuff exists in our watershed and we have lots of quarries around here that are scraping and extracting and kind of uh, digging into the mountainside. So potentially when we have lots of rain, we can also get <coughs> chemicals leaching into our environment. Plants can re also really be negatively impacted by flooding. Um, floods can distribute non-native plants and seeds. If you had a big zone of uh, French broom, which is one of the most common invasive species we have in the county, next to a creek, and that bank sank and flowed downstream and broke apart and just kind of ended up in all these other places to, uh, to thrive and take over. That's a pretty sad story. Um, and same with the seeds. Non-native invasive plants are early colonizers, so if you have a fresh little landslide or some sort of exposed soil because of these storms, you're most likely to see native plants pop up there. Uh, Non-native plants pop up there. Um, so when we have landslides, we're kind of encouraging more recruitment of non-native and invasive plants. Um, back to the turbidity and the murkiness of the water. Um, it blocks the sunlight for aquatic plants that live under the surface of the San Lorenzo River. 
those plants are food for bugs, those bugs are food for salamanders or steelhead, and those things are food to other things, and uh, you get the picture. So we really want plants growing in the streams, and when the streams are too muddy, they can't grow. Um, we also not only have non-native plants, but aquatic invasive species. Um, one is called the New Zealand mud snail. That's the one I'm most curious, or most familiar with, and most curious by. Um, and the um, the streams can really redistribute those populations. And um, so having lots of the snails on gravel, that gravel gets picked up and brought to the mouth of another stream that didn't have them, and maybe they could start migrating up that stream which wouldn't be good. And um, also wanted to shout out, people move a lot of aquatic uh, non-native species around as well. So if you had a boat that you took to a lake and the next weekend you took it to a different lake and you then parked that in your driveway in the San Lorenzo River uh, watershed and you hosed it off and you had some sort of thing growing on your boat or that was trapped and you couldn't see and that goes into the storm drain into the river, like that's on us. If you go fishing or work by the stream or in a stream to like either freeze your boots when you're done to kill anything or somehow sanitize or sterilize them. Um, thanks. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> um, wildlife also gets really impacted by flooding um, in a negative way. The turbidity limits visibility for aquatic animals. So, so if you're really interested in uh, fighting like a Jedi, So it really cleans our watershed. 
unfortunately, a lot of that stuff goes into the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which is one of those beautiful parts of our oceans on our planet. So that's something to consider. Uh, the sediment that flows into the ocean actually stimulates fish um, who are migratory to swim up the river. They use their sense of smell to find their natal streams and places to lay eggs, and so they smell these biogeochemical cues, um, chemicals from, I think about like tannic acid from the tan of trees and the redwoods. I think about the unique geology that we have. So these biogeochemical bio cues are really like a, a fingerprint signature, um, somehow smell related, a smelly fingerprint that <laughs> fish can smell and know where to go home. Um, and the river also becomes really highly oxygenated because there's so much churning and oxygen is great for water quality. In terms of the amount of water and water quantity, it's great to have so much water. Um, we have a lot of in-stream, we have a lot of infiltration to support summer stream flows. So the streams this summer are gonna be colder, they're gonna be fuller than they have been in a really long time since we've got so much rain. Um, again, in the a sheer amount of water flushed out a lot of debris and nutrients and bacteria. Um, so that is all gone from our watershed and probably doesn't survive in salt water. So some of that stuff gets neutralized in the ocean. Um, recharging wetlands with all this water, the sediment transportation, rejuvenate soil fertility. I talked about the floodplains and how important it is to have that leaf litter and the silt and the sand just kind of um, uh, sit, sit there and find a spot to be um, so new plants can grow. Your little uh, big leaf maple seed that spins around and lands in the sand can grow. Uh, more ponds and wet environments for amphibians. So amphibians will dry out if they don't have access to uh, wet environments. So they will probably have a really nice summer. Um, in terms of sediment and streamwood, um, it takes a lot of energy to move a lot of the streamwood out of the way and to move sediment. Um, rivers obviously move a lot of water, but one of their main like jobs um, as a natural feature is to move sediment and help carve river valleys. And you know this landscape looks what it looks like because of this river, because it's moved all the sediment somewhere else. Um, it's moved it to the beach. And so we have these beautiful beaches. We have driftwood to build um, cuts out of or whatever we're gonna do. We have sandbars for awesome surfing at the river mouth. Um, erosion brings fresh gravel into the river, so we have a lot of water on our hillsides. Um, we're getting sediment washed out, but we're also getting some sediment introduced into the system, which is a great opportunity for gravel to be sorted. I keep mentioning gravel because that's where steelhead and salmon lay their eggs. Um, so it's really, really, really important for those species to have clean gravel beds. Um, so all the silt and sand is washed out of those gravel beds with high flows. Um, the wood clusters can increase channel complexity. So we don't necessarily want just a super clean, picturesque stream. We really want it to be chaotic. We want the rocks and boulders and thrash wood and stuff kind of everywhere. Imagine if we, if no one had been here for a million years, our river would look insane and we wouldn't think it's a pretty river at all. And that's kind of the point nature is trying to, it's trying to do that. And to whatever extent we can, um, trying to allow it and even support the river to get kind of complex and chaotic. Um, Streamwood clusters sort the sediment, as you saw in that beautiful diagram. Um, they're refuge for fish, so there's lots of habitat underneath the streamwood clusters. Um, they're also passable. Sometimes when you see one of those clusters on the summer day, I think there's no way a fish can jump over that or get through that. But they actually can kind of float. When there's a high flow, the water's forced beneath that wood structure so much that it, it lifts it. And it's all made of wood, and a lot of wood floats when it's dry enough. So um, these streamwood clusters are passable amazing and important habitat. Interleaf for plants and more. Um, to make this more relevant, I don't know how deeply and personally you all feel connected to streamwood and river sediment, but all of you probably <laughs> even more enjoy beautiful flowers and seeing cool stuff. So this is all stuff from uh, mostly here in Felton, slime molds and mushrooms and beautiful blooms. Um, plants need flooding. So flooding is, is really critical for some plants and really beneficial for lots of other ones. Um, seeds and twigs get distributed by storm flows. Um, willow branches are really well known for just, if they get snapped off and get lodged anywhere in some mud or some sand, they're just gonna grow another gigantic willow plant. And so that's a really cool adaptation. And storm flows can really distribute them. Um, some plant species need disturbance, uh, disturbance in the gravel or 
a weird amount of moisture or a weird amount of sunlight that they're not used to to kind of help promote their life cycle. So um, between those disturbance-dependent plants and pioneer species that thrive and will pop up in a, a freshly disturbed area, um, some of those early plants to colonize uh, uh, area that's kind of been cleared out. Um, that happens a lot when there are floods. Riparian plants slow the water down, so we have lots of plants along the sides of streams. They can slow the water down, causing the sediment to drop out, which lands on their roots, and so they're getting this mixture of um, decomposed rock for drainage. They're getting sand and, and sediment, and they're getting uh, organic material. That's like killer stuff to have laying on your roots if you're a plant. Um, it's great food for the trees. Um, and not lots of native plants can clean pollution too, whether that they're soaking up the nutrients or can somehow um, neutralize any bacteria. So having native plants and floods uh, combining those two is a great recipe. Inundation kills some non-native species, so a benefit from having so much water in the system is that a lot of the native plants can't handle it, or non-native plants can't handle it, um, and so it can suppress the native plant populations. <coughs> Tree falls can create new habitat. Super blooms of wildflowers are beautiful. They're great for pollinators and seed eaters as well. Strong, deep roots of native plants can hold sediment in place, securing stream banks, which is really <coughs> important during flooding. And really for wildlife. <laughs> All these animals depend on the healthy and thriving San Lorenzo River. I love this baby steelhead trout. So, animals also really need <laughs> floods, and these floods are actually really good for lots of our wildlife. Um, they're evolutionarily adapted to floods. This is not like some random fluke thing that happens. If these animals have been here for so, so long, they've seen so many floods. So um, they will get out of the way or they have adaptations to survive, um, if not thrive and benefit. Um, having a lot of water and having floods support sediment, uh, or salmon, steelhead, and lamprey migration, um, partly through some of that sediment sorting. Um, they have lots of new habitat. They can get higher up into creeks that they might not usually be able to get up to. Um, floods bring a lot of debris and um, other opportunities for finding refuge and for small animals that live in the river. There exists a lot of backwater and slow moving habitat um, in the river itself in different pockets of our watershed. So if you're a tiny fish and you can wash downstream because you can't handle it, you're probably going to find some. There's a, enough habitat around. Um, so you won't have to be washed out to the ocean. There's probably going to be somewhere where you can hide if you're an aquatic animal. Um, impeding upstream migration of invasive species. So as I mentioned, those New Zealand mud snails slowly make their way at the snail's pace um, <laughs> up the watershed. But if you have a, a strong flood event, they're all going to get washed back and set back. So we might have had, I'm just making this up, but if we had you know, 2,000 mud snails in Felton, we probably have fewer because they're now in Santa Cruz, and they're going to work their way back up. <laughs> but at, so least, long, Sam. <laughs> at least it's impeding them. Um, and then just the new formation of in-stream habitat, if you had a tree fall down or a boulder get dislodged, um, animals really benefit from having new um, habitat. Um, if you're thinking about, so what happens to the tadpoles and the little water bugs that are so important? They have evolved to not be so small when there's a, a flood going on. So in their life cycle, the, the tadpoles are no longer tadpoles, they're frogs that have hopped off into the forest. The, um, the larvae of the little bugs have turned to big bugs, and those have laid their eggs elsewhere. So there's really not that many like baby animals that need a whole lot of protection. Their life cycles, um, by design, have them elsewhere. Um, higher productivity streams, we have more water, we have more food, which is great for everything. Navigating obstructions um, is something that these animals are designed to do. So if a log falls and there's an um, accumulation of stream wood, the fish get learned to learn. They have evolved to you know, wait out the, the peak of the flood. They know when the sediment's going to drop out so it'll become clear enough, and they can navigate. So they're just not out of luck. They have these tools to navigate. Um, and new riparian plant growth along streams is great for wildlife because um, you know, of all the things that need this new growth. So it's really wonderful, and there are lots of bugs and <coughs> plants that um, if a bug lays an egg and those eggs hatch and drop into the river, that's a lot of good food too. Good food as well. Last slide before we wrap it up, having to do with people. 
There's more sand and wood on the beaches, that's great. We have more sandbars for surfing. We have new pools built in the San Lorenzo River for swimming and snorkeling. Mm -hmm. um, Lomond <laughs> Reservoir is full and beautiful and you can rent a boat there and you can hike there and I went there a couple weeks ago and it was amazing. Um, Streamwood clusters are better habitat for fishing if you are someone who likes to go fishing. <coughs> Even the wood that washes out of the ocean is an ecosystem for habitat for wildlife. I imagine all the wood that was in Felton that is now at the bottom of the Monterey Bay and mm -hmm. there are crabs just like <laughs> doing their thing and loving it. Mm -hmm. We can all protect the San Lorenzo River Anywhere from my little first graders to, I don't want to call who I think is the oldest person in this room, but any age that you are, um, any ability or any resources that you have or don't have, um, if you live along or want to volunteer to help protect riparian zones. If you want to share this talk or any of the resources that are available with other people, maybe you know someone who just bought a house by the creek, like help them by, by sharing what you know. Um, you can, if you want to get really involved, you can engage with regulators and policymakers and landowner groups and stakeholders. Um, drop them an email or try to attend a meeting. Um, if you have the ability to support the cause of slowing the water down, spreading it out and sinking it. If you're a property owner or are you know working with someone, if there's a um, some sort of construction project going on in your neighborhood, like um, keep that in mind. Slow it, spread it, sink it. Um, develop a permeable pavement so water can sink into the ground. It's more expensive, but it's really at the benefit of the watershed. Rain gardens and bioswales are something you can build in developed areas to capture runoff. Um, reflect on traditional eco eco ecological knowledge. Um, that's the knowledge of the indigenous people here um, who have been burning and planting and harvesting from this watershed to its benefit for thousands and thousands of years. Here's a picture of a storm drain mural that the Coastal Watershed Council helped put together. That's just a reminder of people, for people that whatever's on our landscape is gonna go down the drain. So this is an art piece just to remind people to keep trash and other debris off of, of our city streets. You can get your sewer lateral pipe and septic, septic systems checked if you are a homeowner. You can preserve big trees. Don't cut them down unless you absolutely need to. Um, you can plant native plant species. Um, you can research what types of species you might want on the internet or ask at your garden center. They should be able to direct you to a uh, California native plant section. They ought to have one. Um, if they don't, shame on them. Mm -hmm. uh, manage livestock. If you, if you or someone you know has horses or cattle or goats, um, making sure they don't cause erosion problems, especially along streams. Pick up trash. That's something that's so easy to do. And at least the kids I work with absolutely love it. They feel empowered. It's fun to use the grabber and the buckets. It's fun to like feel how heavy the bucket is when you're done. And then their school campus or our field trip site looks beautiful. So it's a really easy thing to do. Um, and it can even help you bond with your neighborhood. Um, conserving water is another really easy thing to do. All of our water comes from this finite source that is the San Lorenzo River watershed. Um, so the, more, the less we can use, the better. And then just using uh, fewer individual cars, both for climate change, and that's another part of the doom and gloom section I didn't talk about. You probably will have this happen again. Um, floods are not going to be a stranger to the San Lorenzo River watershed. Uh, droughts are not. Wildfires are not. So um, our climate is in serious need of support. So however we can help, we ought to. These are just a couple last points. Um, in summary, floods are natural. Animals and plants like can vibe with floods. This is something that is not new to them. Um, the floods of this rainy season have actually probably had a net benefit, so our ecosystem, ecosystem is probably healthier because we have these floods, um, which is kind of weird to think about when you consider like all the hardships um, that humans have felt because of them. Um, watershed healing and restoration takes time. Some projects might be immediate. Some may take decades, and other projects to control or modify streams can just fail. We are at nature's mercy. The river's the boss. Um, human and nature interface is where things get really complicated. So um, we have, not we in this room, hopefully haven't contributed to large scale logging, but um, humans, <laughs> humans have. So uh, we have this really intricate connection and there are lots of ways to help like maybe shift our lifestyle just slightly to really protect our watershed. Everyone can play a role. Um, this is a really complex natural system. So um, to approach its protection holistically. That's, you don't care if you use all the water, 
the native plants that you planted aren't going to thrive. Or if we continue to pollute the river with uh, storm drain and stormwater runoff, then you know what's that uh, log we put in the river upstream really like? So we need to approach this from lots of different angles, basically. And lastly, if you want to support the cause, either financially or by volunteering, or want to stay updated with river news or events coming on, um, CWC, where I work, uh, Monterey Bay Salmon Trout Project, Valley Women's Club, Save Our Shores, Land Trust of Santa Cruz County, Santa Cruz Mountains by Regional Council, and the list goes on to include Friends of State Parks, um, Save the Redwoods League, Semper Virens. Uh, there are lots of places and ways to get involved. Teamwork makes the dream work, but teamwork also makes the stream work. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a photo I took of some Bayview first or second graders this year. And that's it. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, and if you have any questions about the river, I'm also not an engineer. I'm not a policy expert. I don't have all the answers, but I have most answers that if seventh grader and younger <laughs> would ask, so uh, fire them out and be at that level, if you have any. And before well, you take questions, if you would like a, the link to this presentation, it's yeah. going to be in the Felton Library Friends newsletter that comes out tomorrow, and you can sign up to get the newsletter out there. Oh yeah, sign up. <laughs> Sam, the river that was straightened for the logging, has that been allowed to go back to natural, or are they still... Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, there isn't a whole lot of space, unfortunately. I mean, ideally we would have this whole river valley. Um, it's channelized, it's not really a grading, it's not getting shallower, so I think without uh, some serious intervention, it's not gonna be <coughs> like reconnecting to the floodplains. There are some very limited spots where the river and tributaries can meander, but we have so many houses along the river, there's really not a, a couple hundred foot long stretch that doesn't have something important to a person or a road or a bridge or something. So we're kind of limited in being able to let the river be wild. Um, we have some pretty serious human parameters it has to follow now. So does that mean it's getting deeper and getting more channelized each year? Yeah, um, so and I think it, uh, it varies like from tributary to whatever part of the main center you're talking about, but a great example of the entrenched uh, sections are by Henry Cowell. And I think up, it might be up Zianti Creek, the county of Santa Cruz has done some really important habitat work installing yeah. some of those logs and boulders, and that catches sediment. Um, so when you have this in incised channel, um, and you stuff some logs and stuff and slow that water down, it backfills with sediment, and then that can like re-level what's upstream behind it. So um, in some at the re local restoration projects, they've been able to kind of help the stream kind of refill itself, and maybe that would be something to consider for future projects, because yeah, it's a bummer to see how, how deep the river is from like the floodplain, knowing that it should be trickling through there for the frogs. What about then when you get into Santa Cruz where you know the river almost doesn't flow at all because it's gotten so high? Um, it, you know, with, with plants and, and things like that, where I think that th sometimes I see, you know, a bulldozer trying to, to allow the, you know, the water to get through. Um, yeah. Is that part of restoration or just part of keeping the river moving? It, mostly to keep the river moving. In Santa Cruz, like within the city limits, the San Lorenzo River is in this levee system, and that's to keep the river from flooding Santa Cruz, which it's done many times. Um, and to, from the engineering, not necessarily the environmental science, what's best for the animals perspective, but from the, we need to keep people's houses from flooding because FEMA requires us and people have flood insurance and all that, um, they need to get the water out of there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in a wild river, if we didn't have that levee system, we'd have trees all over and the water would be going everywhere. Um, but they do, they, they mow the inboard sides of the levee and they kind of bulldoze trenches. Mm -hmm. um, so the water just, can get out of town. Mm -hmm. You mentioned what Santa Cruz does for the river. Um, is there any uh, role that the state parks play in helping restore mm -hmm. the watershed? Cool. Um, great question. I 
know that the state parks are always pretty on top of it. We were talking just earlier about controlled burns and how in Henry Cal State Park there's tons of um, attention being focused to not only reducing the uh, impacts of non-native species, but um, you know, fires here are natural and they should be happening and we usually don't let them happen because we live, we live here. Um, state parks, like with all the land that they own, um, is really preserving, and I think state parks are in perpetuity, like there's, I don't think they're allowed to just close the state park to let development happen, and as um, they're, they're, they belong to all of us, right, if you pay, ta pay taxes in the state. Um, so there's some things that I know the state park is doing, is that your question? Yes, what's the state park doing? Yeah, yeah, um, state park also, um, yeah, by, I guess preserving the land and shedding light on it to people who visit, it's like a really optic like way to see how important and how beautiful it can be and should be. So having those those preserved areas of our watershed is really important for the public to see what it, what it can really be like versus like if you were to go to Henry Cowell and look at her today and then like take that same snapshot down at the SoCal Bridge in Santa Cruz, it's like really, Though I love the San Lorenzo River through and through, it's obviously more beautiful as it flows through the state park than as it does flow mm -hmm. through Santa Cruz. So to give people, and we try our best to bring students as often as we can to Henry Cowell, because we work with a lot of like lower income students who a $10 park pass for their family is out of the question. They don't even have time to do that, let alone consider spending that money. Um, anyway, state parks are great. <laughs> And don't they have a policy of not removing down wood so that they uh, leave the stream, the, the stream wood clusters in the river? That sounds good to me. I don't actually know that much about the state park <coughs> protocols for protecting watersheds, but um, yeah, I believe it. And if, um, yeah. And the library uh, with the state now has state park passes that can be checked out for three weeks. Um, so That's you cool. talked about people not being able to afford yeah. to go to the parks. That's a really great thing. Yeah, come to the library and get a park pass. Yeah. Well, one of the um, challenges as a volunteer at the park we have is uh, the recreation that happens in the river. Mm -hmm. And specifically the Garden of Eden mm -hmm. is our favorite place to be sad about because um, it is an incredibly uh, overused and abused uh, area, at least from the park's perspective. Um, are, there, are there any kinds of uh, measurements of the impact of recreation um, that you're aware of that are on the watershed? I don't really know, not that I'm aware of. Um, but you're right, there's nothing really worse than going down to a beautiful river spot to find it like full of beer cans and like popped inflatable tubes and just trash. And unfortunately it takes lots of human energy to maintain that stuff that the general public isn't. So that's definitely a crux to get over to like have trash cans installed down there to have someone to maintain a trash can up the side of the river. And then what do you do in the winter time with those trash? So, dang. So we do have river cleanup days and uh, every so often, like about three times last year, and uh, our next one's gonna be in a few weeks, um, we're gonna go down and try to pick up the trash. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm just curious, you know, what else can we do? Yeah, yeah, just like working with the kids, that's, a, that's an easy and really important thing to do um, in the state park because it doesn't have a lot of homes, doesn't have the <coughs> water quality issues, and we need all those rapids and ripples to turn up the water and bring oxygen to it. Um, so that's a good question. I look forward to continuing the conversation with you mm -hmm. and uh, not only sharing the, um, the resources that you just gave, uh, but also maybe helping to find some solutions. Cool. Thank you. So we have an online question. Oh, wow. K.M. Rice wants to know, how are the watersheds and the burn scars, such as in Big Basin? Cool. Good question. How does this all connect with the burns? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the new wood we're seeing in our system is from burn trees. So um, those trees were gonna die and fall down sooner or later, and that ended up being sooner because of the CZU fire. Um, but a lot of that, yeah, a lot of the new wood, and we've even seen a lot of the driftwood that washed up on the beaches after the storm, had pretty serious burn scars on them um, that I would assume was probably from the most recent wildfires. Um, but then again, when you don't have the trees, 
you have a lot of um, vulnerable sediment transportation and uh, landslide issues. Big Basin has really bounced back quite a bit. We don't have as many like gigantic majestic trees, but lots of sprouts of the roots are still alive and the plants are, again, they're, they're used to fires. And so even from our time scale of, um, you know, oh, it's been five years, like it still looks kind of bad. Like, yeah, it's gonna look bad for a long time and it probably might have burned this bad before we were all even here. Mm -hmm. um, so probably the introduction of more sediment, whether that's fine sediments that can maybe not be great for the watershed health, but also lots of gravel and that kind of thing, which is really important for um, ecosystem services. So some good and some bad with the flood wildfire combination. That's kind of how things go. And it's tough to say that as a human being, because we all have had to deal with that poor air quality. And obviously with climate change, that kind of stuff is <laughs> probably worse and gonna be more frequent. Um, I have a hard time cutting myself off because I love talking about this kind of thing. <laughs> Was there any, anything else uh, that people were, thanks online, <laughs> question? Is the soundtrack for your presentation going to be available? <laughs> yeah. I just have to watch Star Wars. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks everyone for coming and for online and for everyone who's going to see this later. Yeah. Um,